Help me count them down from five, four, three, two, one. On the avenue. Welcome to the 2024 Belgian Waffle Ride San Diego. Here's a look at the course. It's 120 miles, about 10,000 feet of climbing. They had to change the course from years past. They couldn't get permits on Black Canyon, but for the most part, pretty similar course to years past, minus a little bit of climbing and some dirt roads. I'm getting some footage from Elliot Baring there, good friend of mine. We actually ended up riding with each other for most of the day, so he got some good footage of my obnoxiously bright kit. This course starts out with a little bit of a pre-log or prologue course, um, a couple little miles through some neighborhoods through the campus university. I was fortunate enough to kind of get a call up. I was supposed to get a call up, but they ran out of time and then I had to just slot in on the front. Um, so I kind of felt weird, but you know, it, it, that is what it is. Uh, here I am trying to stay as close to the front as possible because about four miles in, five miles in, there is a killer climb and I want to be as far forward for that climb as possible. So does Sophia. She's right to my right. She's staying up close to the front as well. Um, that's the name of the game at these races. All right, we are at the base of this climb and it is full tilt. Matt Beers on the front, driving the pace. Guys are getting blown, gaps are opening. It is nuts. I mean, I should have warmed up for this thing. I was not ready for an all out effort four minutes in. I mean, it was bonkers. Just to give you an idea of how hard we were going, it was about seven and a half minutes at 437 watts. My heart rate got all the way up to 200 beats per minute. That is basically my max heart rate. And that was, I don't know, 15 minutes into a six hour race. Yeah, that hurt. Over the top of the climb, I find myself in this little chase group. The leaders are not far ahead, and I know that there are a couple strong guys in this group with me. I've got Elliot on my tail. I've got Carter Anderson, a lifetime athlete ahead of me. Uh, I'm pretty sure Lachlan Morton is in this group, and so we are chasing pretty hard. We got an echelon rider. I know he's strong as well. We're going to work together to try to get back up to this group as quickly as possible. Griffin Easter in this group, Payson, I don't, not McElveen, but another Payson. I don't know his last name from Colorado. We're all together. We hit these cyclocross dismount barriers. Elliot runs into this guy. I don't know what he was doing, to be quite honest. I make the move, pass him. Yeah, just really bad, really bad remounts. Um, that guy was struggling. I was on road pedals, so I was struggling a little bit. Most of the guys, this is the first off-road sector with some gravel. It's fast downhill. I was pretty hesitant um, on these really fast downhill gravel. I was on, basically everybody is on road tires, but you try to find some thicker road tires that, you know, can handle the the 100 miles of off-road riding. Um, so I was on some Challenge Strada Bianca's extra protection casing, size 36. And I was running those at about 29, 30 PSI, a little bit lower than what most of my compatriots were running. I don't even know if that's the right word, compatriots, compatriots, I don't know, my competitors. Most of my competitors run a little bit of a higher PSA, PSI than that having it been influenced by the DJ himself. Uh, I have been riding lower and lower pressures at these races. If you can get by without flatting, it's better for rolling resistance and for just grip on the loose terrain. Elliot makes the pass. We're gonna work together in this group to get back up to the leaders, which we eventually do get back up to the leaders.
All right, so we go down this bombing fast downhill, and at the bottom of the downhill, there's a U-turn before we go into the first pinch point, first real dirt sector, and it is chaos. There are cars stopped at the red light, which also just so happens to be right where we're gonna do our U-turn right here. I was waiting for somebody to cut the U-turn short, and I would have followed if they had done it, but nobody did. Um, not that I'm a cheater, but hey, I'll just follow the wheel in front of me, I guess. But nobody did, so I did the right thing and went all the way around the cone. Uh, I am way too far back in this group. Uh, on the downhill, another group caught back up to the lead group, so we're probably riding 30 strong right now. And I am pretty sure there's only maybe two guys behind me at this point. And I go into this first dirt section way too far back. Um, Adam Roberge is right there. Pete Stetton is only a few spots ahead of me. Uh, and I am just, I think I was just shot from that first really hard effort on the climb. My legs kind of felt like jello. If you've ever done the Stairmaster for like five minutes and then gotten off a Stairmaster, uh, you know what I'm talking about because that's how my legs feel. Just jello-y and weird. I hadn't warmed up before that really hard climb. And so, yep, um, I'm struggling at this point. Not that like the power isn't there, it's just a weird feeling. Uh, and it's, you know, in the back of your head, you're thinking it's a six hour race and I don't wanna go too hard too soon. Now, there were a couple sections of the course where I was really nervous and this was one of those sectors. It is a downhill, rocky, rocky section. There's just all these sharp, big rocks and there's a little bit of a line, but like not really. Um, I mean, no matter where you are, you're going to hit big rocks just sticking up. And you can see that. And I was really nervous about flatting because you're going fast. You're going, it's on a downhill. So you really don't want to grab as much break. But because I didn't want to flat and I'm running a little bit of lower pressure, I was very hesitant on those fast downhills with a lot of rocks like that one. We pop out onto this gravel road. There's gaps. I can see the Aussie National Tramp Connor right ahead of me. Um, we're going to hit this single track section. I'm going to be on his tail. I haven't really passed. I think I've passed three or four guys since the beginning of this dirt sector. So I'm still not in the top 20 and the leaders at this point are probably just gapping me. Um, and the bigger of a gap they get through this dirt section, the less likely it is that I'm actually going to be in that lead group coming out of the dirt section which is not what I wanted going into this race. I knew I wanted to be in the lead group over that first big climb because last year I made the mistake of not being in that group. So I checked that box, but then the very crucial second box that I didn't quite check was being in the lead group after the first dirt section, which is crucial. Um, it's like I, I did what I wanted to at the beginning of the race and then I got lazy and was too far back. And so I'm suffering for that now um, as the leaders are kind of just riding away. This first off-road section is very long. Um, it's about 20 miles, 15 to 20 miles. Um, some of it's single track, some of it's two track, some of it's just gravel road. It's a good mix, but I knew that there was this group ahead of me, about five riders. They had about 20 seconds on me. I was kind of in no man's land, but I knew that I would catch them on, I think this is called Raptors Ridge. That's what somebody told me, which is a pretty cool name for some off off-road single track. I knew that this was a steep climb and I knew there were that, that there were some technical rock sections. And so I figured 
whatever group was ahead of me, I'd be able to catch them through those technical bits. So I was able to catch them. I was able to pass Connor, the Australian champ. I'm in this group here with Elliot Baring, Payson from Colorado, and Scott Funston is behind us, but he doesn't stick with us for that long. Um, we pop him on the first really long climb. So the three of us are really just going to spend the lion's share of the race together. Um, we stay together all the way until very late in the race. Um, Payson ends up with a mechanical at mile like 100 and then uh, me and Elliot ride all the way to the final climb together. This is me grabbing a bottle through an aid stop. Kind of hectic there. I was trying not to have to stop so he grabbed me a bottle really quick and I, I downed it. My strategy for these races are to start with all of my carbs, either in my bottles or in my pockets, and then throughout the race, grab more hydration via water bottles from the aid stops. And they're usually pretty good about handing them so that you don't have to stop. Um, but you'll see that I have to stop a couple times to grab bottles, but that's okay. Uh, that's much better than having to find somebody to drive to all these spots and support me. I'd rather just be able to do it on my own and um, and BWR is pretty cool about that. This is that new section. I think it's called Poma. We drop down into the park, this bombing fast ascent. I kind of wish I was ahead of Payson on this because I had pre-rode this and knew that you basically didn't have to touch your brakes on this entire downhill. I mean, you could like super tuck and just let it go after these first couple little turns here. Uh, you can see me getting pretty close to him. Um, probably should have made the pass, but super fast. I know that at the bottom of this, we're gonna turn right onto some single tracks, so I am already in my head thinking I'm gonna lead into that and hopefully push the pace through the dirt sections, and if I can gap these guys, then good, and if not, at least I'm leading and pushing the pace. We are climbing up out of Poma, um, that big downhill that we went down, we had to climb up and out of, and I was leading on the climbs. Um, it's always better to lead on the climbs and then not lead on the downhills because there's less of a drafting advantage on the climbs. And so if I lead on the climb, it gives the perception that I'm doing a lot of work and they're behind me just drafting when really they're not really. Um, and then I can just sit back here and kind of chill on the downhill and let them do the pulling on the downhill and I get majority of a share, uh, major, I get more of a benefit drafting on the downhill. So uh, I want to try to minimize the time that I'm on the front on the downhill unless it's advantageous for me to be pulling because I can go faster. So I'm not, you know, I'm not doing that to tick these guys off. I'm doing that to save as much energy as I can so that later in the race I can attack and drop them. Yeah, you might think that that's not so friendly, that these guys were my, you know, we're in this group together, but it is a race, and I want to beat both of these guys, regardless of how much time we spend together and the chasing that we're doing. Um, and I was pretty sure we weren't going to be catching the leaders, and so you have to think strategically. This is going into the, you know, the beginning of the final dirt section. Again, it's a pretty long dirt sector, but this section we only hit on the way back to the finish line. 
And I really wanted to hit this one hard because I felt really good about this off-road section. It's very flowy and twisty and fast. And uh, again, I had pre-rode this and knew that I felt really good on this particular couple miles of trail. So I wanted to lead into this and really just push the pace. And right as we're turning into the trail was when Payson suffered his mechanical. He's no longer with us. I don't know if it was a flat or a dropped chain, but I could hear uh, audibly his frustration with his bike and the mechanical. But I can also hear that Elliot is right on my tail. Elliot has a mountain bike background. We've raced each other in endurance mountain bike events. He's beaten me, I've beaten him. I know that we're close as far as fitness and skills is involved. And so I knew that it was gonna be tough to drop him. Um, and I'm not able to um, through this section. Another really frustrating thing about some of these races is same thing happened at the Mid-South where we hit these narrow single track trails at the end of a race when it's kind of a crucial point in my race or in the pro race where this is a part of the race where gaps could be formed, breakaways could be happening. Uh, I'm trying to actively drop the guys that I'm with, but I'm also hitting lapped traffic. There's guys with flats on the side of the trail and I'm passing what seems like an endless train of amateur riders and they're frustrated because we're passing them. I'm frustrated because I have to pass them. It's dangerous for both of us to try to squeeze onto this narrow trail. It's frustrating for Elliot because if I get a gap because of a lapped rider, that's not really fair and I don't really want to drop him because of that. In fact, on a little section right up here, you can see it's really rocky and there was a lady off her bike walking and I actually uh, tipped over because I, uh, I, she was standing right where the trail went and I didn't get unclipped fast enough. And so I tipped over and uh, in frustration was like, oh man, why do they put all these amateurs on this course? And of course I wasn't saying that to her. And if she's watching this, I apologize. I didn't mean to offend you in any way. It's just unfortunate that we have to share this one little trail with their race and our race. And I don't want to affect their race. They don't want to affect ours. I just wish there was an alternative to have the pros on their separate course not interfering with another race. So here I am at the aid. I grab a bottle. Elliot stops and waits for me. What a homie. He's a lot nicer than I would have been. I don't know if I would have stopped if he had to stop like that. But he also asked me to grab him some water. So I grabbed a bottle for him. I hand it off to him. Um, now we connect back onto some trail that we had ridden. So it's kind of like an out and back this course. And so uh, right here, we're back onto trail that we were previous previously on, and we're going back towards the final climb. I know that I won. I kind of want to drop Elliot on this single track, so I'm leading again, and I want to push the pace. But I'm not going to drop him because he's pretty good technically, so he's right on my tail, as you can see. But I do know that there is this big 20 to 30 minute climb at the end of this race called Double Peak. And Double Peak itself is a really steep, maybe one or two mile pitch. But before that, I mean, you're climbing for a good 15, 20 minutes. And so I know in the back of my head, I want to empty the tank on that climb, but I also don't want to go into that climb having already emptied my tank. So it's a balancing act of saving energy, but also going hard through this off-road section. Also trying not to flat, it's pretty late in the race. And so I'm doing my best to avoid the sharp and big rocks so that I can make it to the final 20 miles of pavement without having to worry about flat tires.
So we pop out onto the road. This basically marks the beginning of the paved climb all the way up to Double Peak. Um, I'm still with Elliot, but I'm going to take the lead here soon and kind of just put my head down and just gruel and grind it out for this long climb. I had a power in mind. I wanted to keep the power at least over 300 watts. If not, try to hold 330 or higher. I think in the, the year prior, I had only managed to hold about 280 average for the entire climb. This is me catching Ian Boswell, former world tour racer, has done the Tour de France. Not only do I pass him and drop him on the climb, but he knows who I am. He comes up and rides next to me. He's like, yo, Dillman. And I'm like, bro, how do you know who I am? I am a goofball that's never raced professionally. I'm doing this gravel thing, privateer. Uh, and he's like, dude, I love the podcast. And I'm, he listens to the Bonk Rose podcast, which is unreal. That podcast seems to be blowing up. I'm tired of him. Oh, we're, woo! <laughs> we haven't seen you all day working his way back from the middle of freaking nowhere. Let's go, Drew. Here you've got John Borselman, who can't race because of a bump head. He is... He was so encouraging. He was like yelling at me. He was saying, man, come on, this is Drew Dillman. I can see, so I've already passed Ian Boswell. I can see Griffin Easter right ahead of me. You can see his his shadow. Of course, I'm passing amateur riders, but a couple times you can see his shadow right ahead of me. And we only have maybe five, six miles to the finish and it's all downhill. And I know that he comes from a road background, I'm pretty sure. And so I'm thinking, man, I might be able to catch him on this off-road downhill section so i'm gonna pin it but i'm also like it's a fine balance between i'm gonna pin it to go as fast as i can but i also don't want to crash on this dirt section because that would probably let ian boswell catch me and i'm definitely not gonna catch griffin easter if i crash so it's a balancing act of pushing the pace but also being safe and not flatting pop out onto the pavement and it is a super super fast downhill turn like super tuck if you look there's two riders right here you, that that next rider ahead of me he goes into that turn ahead of me that is griffin he's literally like only 10 seconds ahead of me we pop through campus i know that there's only like four more turns which for and i'm also going through laps or you know amateur traffic so i'm trying not to interfere with their race and be polite as i pass them but i'm full crit mode i am like carving these turns i am sprinting out of all the turns um it's kind of a disadvantage for griffin because he's going into these traffic turns and kind of opening up traffic for both of us um so he has to hesitate to make sure traffic is cleared but i don't have to hesitate which again it's kind of weird how these races finish. Um, you know, there is a lot of traffic and lights, um, but I don't catch him. I'm really close. You can see him right ahead of me. He's the next rider in front of me. I'd say maybe five, six seconds, but it's two downhill dirt turns from here. So if I haven't caught him here, there's apps, even if I was on his wheel, there's no way I'm going to pass him on these sketchy downhill gravelly dirt turns. So I roll in, he rolls in for a 12th finish, I roll in for a 13th place finish on the day. I'm happy with that, I'm a little disappointed in the way that I raced, uh, that I wasn't in that lead group. I would have loved to have actually raced with the lead group, uh, been a part of that action. I think I had the legs to do that. I just, bad strategy going into that dirt section of Lemon Twistenberg in a poor position. Um, so lesson learned there. Not only do I have to make it over the first climb with the leaders, I have to go into that first dirt section with the leaders as well. And looking at the totals for the 
day. It was a 369 TSS day. That is a big day on the bike. Intensity factor was 0.8, which is definitely on the high end. Average normalized power was 294. Average was 254. Average heart rate 175. Max heart rate 200 beats per minute, happening 15 minutes into the race. Not ideal. I never bonked during this race, so I'm happy about that. Uh, I did a good job with my nutrition. I started with my typical two bottles of overly concentrated flow formulas with about 150 grams per bottle, two flasks of endurance gel mix in my pockets, both of those having about 150 grams per flask. And then I had some backup uh, cliff box, cliff shots with caffeine that I also consumed during this race. Um, pretty close to the finish line. If we're looking at the final climb, if I highlight from the bottom of the climb to the top of double peak, try to get as close as I can with those numbers. It's a 22 and a half minute climb. I averaged 335 watts, which has exceeded my goal. My goal was 330 average for the whole time. Uh, that's a 0.91 intensity factor, so pretty close to threshold effort for five miles. And that's coming at you know, mile 110-ish, 105 to 115, I think, is the is the main part of the climb. Um, so I'm happy with that. To be able to put out that kind of power that late in the race is definitely a good sign. From here on out, I have pro road nats and crit nats coming up in a couple of weeks. After that, I've got the Snake Alley Memorial Day weekend races after that. And then right after that is Unbound. So I've got a block of super high volume here for about 10 days and then i go into that three week race block and that's all i got for this video thanks to all my sponsors uh rigged lightner state uh ignition coach co obviously um these are the big sponsors for me who have made this year possible and i definitely want to say thanks to them if you want to support me you can support them and you can find all the links discount codes all that fun stuff down in the description below and that's all I got. See you guys in the next one.